Hello and welcome to our second class of Psych 250 Developmental Psychology for the summer 2017 semester at NDSU. Um, just before, as we get started, I would like to sort of respond to some emails that I got um, after our first class. There are several students who are concerned about whether or not they should drop the class because um, they're not going to be able to come to take the tests or to come to do the projects because they're out of state or they have a full-time job during the summer. I just want to reiterate, that's okay. If you can't make it into campus, if you're in Fargo but you're working full-time, that, that's also a legitimate excuse. I hadn't thought about that, but that is definitely a valid excuse. So if you signed up for this class because you wanted the flexibility of an online class, you can still have that flexibility. I just need you to communicate with me about what your needs are and I'm more than happy to accommodate. So please do not drop the class. I understand you signed up for an online class for the flexibility. And I will be very flexible. I just need you to let me know what you need. I need you to let me know um, as soon as possible so that I can um, provide you with the best possible learning experience. So it was not a problem. I, it will not create extra work for me one way or the other. Um, I just need to, I need to know what you need. So <clears throat> in order to effectively collect this information, what I'm going to do um, is on this module on Blackboard, I've put a link for a survey that I'd like for you to take. It's very short. Um, it will ask you what times um, you are generally available Monday through Friday. So just think about on a general week, what times would you be available and please select all that apply. And then I'll look and see what days and times work for the most people. And that's when I will schedule our exams and our project work days. For the people who that is not going to work, um, either because they're out of state or out of town or are working or um, because they, um, you know, just because their schedule isn't going to work um, with everyone else's, I will come up with something alternate that will not be, it will not be a bother, it won't be a hassle, you don't need to drop the class over it. So just, I want to make sure you understand, that's okay, I get it. This is an online class and I'm going to do everything that I can to make it as flexible and also as, as meaningful as possible. All right, so if you have any concerns, please email me, darcy.corbetthall um, at ndsu.edu, and um, I'll be happy to address them. Also, while we're on the subject, if you need an accommodation for whatever reason, um, please contact me um, within the next two weeks so that we can talk about it. All right, um, so one thing that you'll find as I email you a million times throughout the semester, and I will, um, I, I was actually averaging about once a day towards the end of last semester and I, I was going through when I was recreating the blackboard and looking at how many times I'd emailed the class and I was like, oh my gosh, how annoying I was. But I think it also <laughs> maybe explained why the students were really attached to me by the end of it because we were communicating on a regular basis. So, um, but the, re the reason I bring that up is one thing that you'll learn about me is I really love memes and I love cultural references and I especially love animated um, adult cartoons like Family Guy. I love Family Guy. I make a lot of Family Guy references. I actually like the Cleveland show, No Judgment. Um, American Dad, eh. The Simpsons, eh. Futurama, love Futurama. And so our meme for today, and we will have memes every day um, from this point forward. Um, I wasn't sure if it would work, but I'm just going to make it work. But our meme today is Zoidberg, Dr. Zoidberg saying, boo, your theory is bad and you should feel bad. That was my best, Dr. Zoidberg. Not very good. I'll do a Yoda for you and a Chewbacca at some point in the, in the semester. I love Star Wars. In fact, I have right here next to my desk, Star Wars Collector's Cup from Walmart. It was a really, really cheap. Um, actually, it's a horrible cup, but it's cool looking. It makes me look really cool. Um, and then, I don't know if you can notice, but on, well, you can't, but on my bookshelf up there, I've got the original um, uh, Star Wars box set. So I love Star Wars, so I'll be making a lot of those references. All right, so enough chit-chat. Um, that is something you'll notice. I like to start class just kind of checking in, talking a little bit, just to kind of get us all warmed up. Um, I promise it will all tie back in together. So the reason I use this meme and the reason I'm using bringing Dr. Zoidberg into the, into the class is because today we're going to be talking about research methods, and we're going to be talking about what makes science a science. And so, like I said, the topic... Oh, I didn't change the title. 
drat. <laughs> the topic of today um, is uh, major theories of development and research methods. So we are going to be talking about the different things that um, Sorry, I'm so thrown off now because the, the, the PowerPoint is wrong and it really bugs me. Um, I Because the class is longer than it typically is, uh, I consolidated several slides, so I forgot to change the title, and that really bugs me. But we'll be talking, we'll start off by talking about major theories of development, and then we'll move into research methods that help us to test different hypotheses derived from these theories. <clears throat> So let's start with the information processing theories. These are a set of theories which propose <clears throat> that humans encode stimuli, transform it into knowledge, and then organize it as memories. In other words, I have this post-it note here. It has information that's reminding me about what I need to be working on this week. And as I read this, I'm encoding it. I'm taking the information in and I'm recording it in my mind. And I'm taking this recording that is in my mind, and I'm turning it, I'm transforming it, I'm turning it into something tangible, knowledge. Now I remember, now I know what I need to get done this week. And then I'm organizing it as memories actively without even thinking about it. I'm, I'm in the back of my mind thinking about, okay, I need to remember this, and so I'm, I'm will probably in a couple days, a couple hours even, think about this post-it note and the information on it, and I'll remember it because it'll be a memory. And part of this information process, the information processing theories, is the idea that individual, individuals actively make sense of the information they receive. We don't just stare at a piece of paper and think, and not think about it, and just like mindlessly take it in. We're actively thinking about it, we're making sense of it, and we're, you know, trying to connect it with other information that we have. This is a continuous theory, meaning that to refresh our minds, the trend, the process, is like this. It's a gradual increase where we start with a very, we start with a very basic form of knowledge or a very basic form of understanding or, or memory, and then over time we sophisticate that. It becomes better, as opposed to discontinuous, where we have stages, where things, things have a definite start and stop, and we get new skills. We don't build upon what we have, we just get new things. Information processing theories propose there are six processes that exist throughout the lifespan. The first is perception. So the way that we see information, take it in and interpret it, attention, so our ability to focus our mind and our thoughts on a very specific task, memory, the ability to recall, to think about things that we've already learned, that we've encoded and, and put in the back of our mind, to bring it forward, to put it back on our desk, to think about it again, planning, the ability to think about the process that we need to do in order to do something. So when I sit down to get ready for a class, I have a very specific process that I have to plan out. I need to get the slides together. I need to go through them really fast and refresh my memory about what we're talking about. I need to sit down at the desk. I need to pull, open the broadcasting software. I need to record the lecture. I need to make sure that I don't stop recording accidentally halfway through. It's a process that requires planning. And so that's one of our processes according to this theory. Categorization, our ability to group different bits of information into separate little boxes that, that where all the information in those boxes match. And then comprehension, our ability to think and to understand and to process and to, and to think deeply about the information that we're taking in. One of the subsets of developmental psychology that, that really promotes and works within this information processing framework is developmental cognitive neuroscience. And this is a multidisciplinary field which examines brain development in relation to changes in cognition and behavior. We have people in our department who are developmental cognitive neuroscientists. And they do work and look at the way our brains change, our brains grow, our brains get worse in relation to the way that cognition, the way that we think and process information um, changes and grows and develops. And behavior, how that behavior, our behaviors as human beings are affected by the way that we um, in employ our cognition. The thing that differentiates 
developmental cognitive neuroscience from like social developmental science um, is that uh, the developmental cognitive neuroscience uses more scientifically rigorous methods such as like EEG or fMRI um, t technologies. They can actually take an image of the brain or look at the brain like energy waves of the brain and they have actual data that's tangible as opposed to like social psychology or social developmental psychology where we get our information based on observation or based on self-report data or the data that is um, reported from a friend or a family member or a teacher so it, we it's not it's it's all it's all uh, in, in some regards conjecture, right? We, we don't have we, a very clear picture. It's just an image as opposed to an fMRI or an EEG, which is pretty cut and dry. This is exactly what we could see if we could actually dissect the brain and look at the way it's working. Another category of theories are ethology and evolutionary theories. Um, and the the main field that of developmental psychology which uses these theories is evolutionary developmental psychology and and evolutionary developmental psychology seeks to understand the adaptive value of different competencies and their changes over time so in other words going back to our discussion of the evolutionary theory and my darcy versus usain bolt example um, evolutionary developmental psychologists would try to understand what is the adaptive value of being able to run fast and how does that adaptive value change over time and how does that change result in genetic changes, social changes, um, psychological changes, emotional changes, personality changes, etc. Along with this is, is, is ethology, which is the study of the adaptive or survival value of behavior and its evolutionary history. So, for example, um, we think about we think about anxiety, and we commonly think of anxiety as a mental illness. And it's I, I don't like the term mental illness. I prefer psychological disorder. I originally was training to be a clinical psychologist, and um, so I, I prefer developmental or sorry, psychological disorder. Um, but anxiety in a way has an adaptive or survival value. Anxiety is our brain's way of saying, whoa, something is terrifying me, I'm gonna get hurt. And it's our body's way of responding to it. it increases our heart rate, it increases our breathing. It prepares us to, f to, to fight or flight, to fight or to run away. Um, and so there is a very important role that anxiety plays in our lives. However, people with anxiety disorders take it to an extreme, right? Where the anxiety becomes a controlling fa factor or a controlling feature in their life instead of something that helps them to survive. So an evolutionary psychologist or evolutionary developmental psychologist would look and say, okay, how does this specific behavior, how does this specific disorder, what is, how does it develop? And then why did it develop? What kind of survival role did it play in this person's life? Within ethology and evolutionary theories are two very important periods, a critical period and a sensitive period. Now a critical period is a time, the only time when an acquisition of a certain skill is possible. In other words, at a certain age you have to develop a skill or you'll never ever develop it. And a wonderful example of this that, well not wonderful, but a good example of this, and you may be familiar from intro or from a sociology class, is that of Jeannie. Um, this girl who was basically kept in solitary confinement by her abusive parents um, from, you know, birth until, you know, middle childhood. She didn't really interact with anyone. She did not have the ability to communicate using sophisticated language. Um, she couldn't speak at all, actually, when first discovered. And this is because there is a critical period for language in which it's you have to acquire certain structures in order for you to be able to develop more sophisticated communication skills. Um, a, on the other side of this, though, is a sensitive period. And a sensitive period is a more soft, gray period as opposed to either you have it or you don't. You either you either get it by this point or you don't have it at all. And a sensitive period is a, it's an optimal time, so the best time for the acquisition of certain skills. They can be developed later, but with difficulty. And the perfect example of this is learning a second language. So I'm sure 
Everyone in this class has probably taken a second language. I would imagine either Spanish, German, maybe French. Um, in, in Alabama, the common language that we learn as our second language is Spanish because we do have a very high Latinx population. Um, I took Spanish in high school, and it was um, muy difícil. Um, actually, that's more of a French accent. Um, and I took French in, in college and lost all of the Spanish. I can communicate just enough to get by. In fact, I went to Austin for a conference um, in April, and all of my drivers were um, Latinx. And so I actually talked to them very poorly in Spanish. They were very amused. Um, but it was good practice. But language, the acquisition of a second language, is, is something that's subject to a sensitive period. When you're younger, it's easier to learn multiple languages, which is why it's so important for children to learn languages, more than one language. Um, it's not impossible for adults to learn a second language, but it's much more difficult because our brain is not primed to be receiving new vocabulary and new grammar. And so that is an example of a sensitive period, as opposed to a critical period where it is possible for us to develop second or third. I, have, I speak um, conversationally two languages, and I speak, can get by in three, right? So like, it is possible to do so. However, it's very difficult. Vygotsky, Lev Vygotsky, is, was a Soviet um, psychologist who was, I think, incredibly brilliant and is incredibly underrated, um, largely because we just have recently discovered his work because it was not imported out or exported out of the Soviet Union. Um, but Vygotsky developed what he called the sociocultural theory. Um, where the, f the focus on our development is shifts towards the cultural context of individual experiences. And I think this is really interesting. And I, I, I personally enjoy looking at development from this perspective, um, especially being a Southerner who's lived for the last two and a half years in North Dakota. This culture is very different than the one I've grown up in. And for many of my students in the past, and I'm sure many of the students currently in the class, you would be in culture shock if you left North Dakota, because many of you probably haven't left North Dakota that often, or gone that far beyond maybe Minnesota or Montana or South Dakota. I had students, I've had students who said they'd never left North Dakota before, which I think was astounding since we're only like five minutes from Minnesota. Um, so, when I moved here, I was I was very uh, taken aback by some of the cultural differences between Alabama and North Dakota. And over time, as I've observed people and observed, I've had friends who are from here, I can see how they approach the world in a much different way than I do because of the cultural context in which their individual experience occurred. And what Vygotsky would propose, and his explanation for this difference that I've noticed in my life, is that, is that culture is transmitted to individuals through social interactions. In other words, children interact with adults of the same culture, and the adults transmit cultural values, cultural expression, cultural practices to them through talking to them, through language, through observation. Um, and that this, this exchange, this transmission of culture from one individual to another happens through a socially mediated process. In other words, mastery and different competencies and different abilities occurs through guided trial and error. So for example, if we were actually interacting in, in a lie in real time and I were to ask a question and you were to get it wrong, the, the, the right thing for me to do is to guide you to the right answer and to help you come to the right answer. And this trial and error, you getting it wrong and then learning how to get it right, helps you to learn and to grow. And, and Vygotsky also proposed that we learn, we, we get this, this, this knowledge through scaffolding or um, this idea that as we master one competency, we're equipped to master a more complex one. So, for example, um, you take Intro to Psychology. It's a very broad class that covers a, the, a wide spectrum of the history of psychology, the different subsets of psychology, the different theories of psychology, but it's incredibly broad. 
but it prepares you. It gives you a foundation upon which you can now build developmental psychology. And then later you could take experimental developmental psychology, but you would probably want to take research methods before that. And that would create another scaffold that would lift you up and get you to the place where I am currently as a, uh, almost a third year graduate student. Um, because I've had all of this training, right? And so this scaffolding, this, this raising up, this, this creation of new platforms raises you and, and, and teaches you um, the things that you need to know through these social interactions. It's incredibly interesting. Again, it's not something that has gained, it's, it's becoming much more uh, popular and well known in our, in our science, but um, I, I just, I love Vygotsky, and we'll talk about v Vygotsky a lot this semester. Our next theorist is Bruffenbrenner. What a great name, Bruffenbrenner, um, who, his theory is called the ecological systems. Um, the ecological systems theory proposes that development occurs within a complex system of relationships affected by our environment. And he proposed that there are five systems. The microsystem, which is our immediate surroundings. The mesosystem, a meso being between, which is the relationship between the different microsystems that we um, encounter. The exosystem, so our external system, which are the social settings in which our, our relationships and our immediate surroundings find themselves. The macro, so the larger system, um, is our cultural values. It's the sort of the framework or the fabric of our society that it provides the context, the master context for all of our experiences. And then chrono system, chrono meaning time, are life changes which occur within a person's life. So they're not systems that exist in permanence, they're just changes that happen. So if we were to use an example, let's talk about my ecological system. All of these things, my parents and sisters, my church, this class, wellness center, because I have a love-hate relationship with it, all of these things are my microsystems. These are contexts, these are our experiences, these are places which influence who I am as a person. So there's a direct relationship between me and my parents, between me and my church, between me and my class, and between me and the wellness center. Now, well, there could potentially be interactions and relationships between all of these things. In fact, there are. My parents and sisters, and, and my church have a relationship. Um, my church, to some degree, has a relationship with my class. I've had people from my church in my class before. I've, I talk about my church in my class, and I talk about my class in my church. Um, uh, the Wellness Center and, and Psych 250 could have an interaction with each other because I'll probably tell you stories about my failure to exercise and diet. And then my parents also and my sisters are, are, are encouraging and, and, and are accountability buddies when it comes to my pursuit of trying to be healthy. And so the relationships that exist between all of these microsystems is the mesosystem, or are the sets of mesosystems within my ecological system. Now let's take a wider picture here. The exosystem is sort of all of the things that within which these different these different microsystems exist. So the place where I work and go to school, the the practitioners and therapists that help me with the problems that I experience in my life, the town in which I live, um, extended family who are maybe not directly influencing but do have some kind of an influence, who do touch on all of these different contexts within my microsystem. And then our macro system is the context, the larger context in which we find ourselves. So for me, my community as a transgender person, um, my country as an American, um, the greater LGBT community, um, and then also my heritage as a <clears throat> Anglo-French individual are all cultural experiences which influence who I am as an individual. And they, in they influence um, they influence this exosystem, which then in turn influences the mesosystem. 
The Chronos system occurs across all of these systems. And these are things like getting married, having a child, growing old with someone, retirement, death potentially. All of these things are life experiences that do have bearing on our developmental experience, but they don't necessarily happen all the time. Or they don't, I mean, I guess you could get married like every year. I think after a while the, the court cuts you off. But like, <laughs> you could have children all the time too. My parents are perfect examples of that. Um, but... You know, there are things that don't happen, that they're, they're not experiences or relationships or interactions that happen on a permanent daily basis. But they do influence potentially all levels of your ecological system. I'm now going to give you your discussion board question. Please continue to watch the, the, the clip, um, the lecture. There's still a lot we're going to, go, going to go through, and it gets only more complicated from here. But what I'd like for you to do for your discussion board is I want you to, to discuss an important life event, such as a move to a new city, an inspiring teacher coming out as LGBTQ+, having your first child, parental divorce, or anything else that has impacted your life. And I want you to talk about how that event affected you as a person. And then... I want you to consider the second the second question, which is how might have things gone differently if for you if it had been when you were five years younger than when you it happened to you, or if you were five years older. So if it happened to you when you're 20, what if it had happened to you when you were 15, or when you were 25? Would it have been different? Would the outcome have been different? Definitely, I can think of experiences where it would have been totally different had I been older and wiser, or where it would have been tragic if I had been much younger and much more immature. So I'm gonna I'm gonna Take a pause so that you can write this question down, um, and um, then when the lecture is over, go to the discussion board, and using the subject class two, I want you to answer these questions. Alright, got that written down? Good, let's move forward. Good, I thought I'd stop recording. I'm paranoid now. <laughs> okay, now we're going to move into research methods. We've talked about the major theories of development. And these theories are ways of thinking, modes of thinking, processes of thinking, um, which are which provide a context or a, a larger framework for our research as developmental psychologists. But the work that we do, the research that we do, is driven by the scientific method. Now, I assume that you've all taken a science class at some point in your academic career, and you've probably been introduced to the scientific method. But we are going to go through it again, because I want to make sure that we have a good grasp on what all of these things are. The scientific method is a multi-step process by which we are able to answer a research question through a very orderly and predictable and uh, um, standardized set of procedures. Predictable, I should say, in the sense that 
if it's a scientific study, if it is empirical, we c it is predictable what specifically will be done, not necessarily the outcome. Science is very, very, very frustrating because very rarely do your hypotheses pan out completely the way that you want. So the first part of the scientific method is asking a research question. Why does this phenomena happen? And I ask you, as you are preparing for class today, to think about a question that you would like to have answered that pertains to development. <clears throat> so a research question that comes up time and time again in my own research is, why, if we are friends with people, do friends continuously not help their other friends when those people are in distress? Um, my career as a psychologist began because I read a news article about this kid who was gay, who was in high school, very close to graduating, who, who died by suicide because he was being bullied. And even though his friends knew and his parents knew, no one did anything to stop it. And so that's always bugged me. So my question, the question that's always in the back of my mind is why do people who claim to love and care about others do nothing in response to the uh, person's pain or suffering? So my research question, that is my research question. Why does this specific thing happen? So once I have my question, the first thing that I do after that is I go and look at literature. And I'm gonna show you what literature looks like. So hold on just a second. Thank you. I should have been better prepared. We go to the literature. We go to the published scientific studies that other people have done. So here's an example of the literature. This is a journal called Suicide and Life-Threatening Behavior. I've been published in this journal. And in this specific issue, we have articles like an eating disorder inpatient adolescent self-criticism predicts non-suicidal self-injury, or victimization of lesbian, gay, and bisexual people in childhood association with suicide attempts. We also have things like empirically derived subgroups of self-injurious thoughts and behaviors, application of latent class analysis. And so if you were to open up this journal, you would see all of these different articles which outline the way that a person answered, so here's, here's a, what it looks like on the inside. Um, you would find an article that outlines how a person, what their question was, and then how they use the scientific method to come up with an answer to that question. And so what we would do as an informed scientist, as an informed consumer of science, would go to journals like Suicide and Life-Threatening Behaviors or other journals that publish content similar to what we're interested in, and we would review that literature. We would read the different articles related to what we're interested in, and we would ask the question, what have these other studies found? This gives us a new place to start. It helps us to refine our question so that we can ask a very specific question that leads to a hypothesis. And the hypothesis is our prediction about what we think the answer might be. So for example, if my research question is why do friends ignore, the, the, ignore their friends who are in trouble? One potential explanation or one potential answer is that maybe those friends don't feel like they could do anything to help. And so a hypothesis based on that prediction would be uh, adolescents who do not feel like they, who feel incompetent or don't feel like they have high social status are less likely to help a friend in need than peers, than friends who do feel competent, who do have, feel like they have a higher social stand, um, standing. Our hypothesis has to be something that we can test. And that leads to the second, or the next step in the, in the scientific method, testing. We, we conduct an experiment. We come up with some kind of method that can provide a systematic, consistent, the same across for every single person who participates, way to test the hypothesis. And this is how we collect our data. 
we, we use questionnaires, we use procedures, we collect M um, MRI data, we collect EEG data. Then the next phase or the next step in the method is analysis. We use statistical methods to test the different data that we have to see what, what connections we can find that are statistically significant. Finally, we report or next, I should say, but for most people, it's finally, we report what we find. We report the answers that we have derived from our hypothesis test in a journal. So we publish our findings in a journal like Suicide and Life-Threatening Behavior. I know they're not paying me to promote the journal, and I have not submitted something for publication, and I'm not tr vying for publication, or am I? <laughs> no, this is just the one that was at hand. Um, a good scientific method and a good scientist would then retest these questions. Um, and, and this is what we do to, in theory when we're doing a lit review, when we're looking at the literature, when we're coming up with a refined research question. We're retesting what other people found. We're saying, well, they found this. So let's see, do we find the same thing, but do we find it if we do it a little bit differently? And, and through this testing and retesting of hypothesis, we're able to come up, if we find the same thing twice, we're can, we can say with some confidence, okay, look, maybe this is the answer. We can't say for sure that our experiment proves anything, but we can say, yes, it suggests it or it highly indicates it. Um, it's, it's hard to prove. You, and you would not say in scientific language that I've proved this or my study proves this because there, there's, it's a very flawed way of thinking because if you can't say something proves something unless you've tested it a thousand times or m maybe even a million times with a bunch of different people because you can always make a mistake, a slight mistake that you would never ever think of that could be giving you the answer. So we, we tend to, in science, um, think about our findings as strong suggestions or evidence for the, the question or the answer that we think um, best describes what is real um, in terms of our research question. So our hypothesis is a predicted answer to an observed problem. And a good hypothesis is based on prior scientific evidence or on a pattern of observations from everyday life. In other words, we're not just coming up with something like out of the blue. We have a pretty good idea based on what other people have found or based on things that we've seen over and over and over again that this is, in fact, a pretty good prediction. A good hypothesis should also outline how the hypothesis will be tested. So you want to be clear about how you're going to find proof or find evidence for your hypothesis. And it should predict a specific outcome. Um, it needs to say this is what we're, we think we're going to find. Um, so some examples, and we can rate these on if they're good or not. So I predict that something will happen. I want you to think about this. Is this a good hypothesis or a bad hypothesis? Or is it an okay hypothesis? I predict that something will happen. Well, if you said it was a bad hypothesis, you were right. This is a bad hypothesis because it's not really based on any previous evidence. We don't have any, we don't have any evidence um, that something will happen. Um, it doesn't tell us how we're going to test the hypothesis. And it doesn't predict a specific outcome. I think something will happen. Well, yeah, no duh. Something probably will happen. You're not, you know, it's, it's sort of like going to, uh, 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 you know, a psychic reading and they're like, oh, you're, you're going to, you're going to have money at some point in your life. Well, yeah, everyone gets money at some point in their life. You're going to come into a lot of money. Yeah, well, $100 is a lot of money for me, and you can usually expect to receive a check for $100 at some point in your life. Um, so it's not a really a good hypothesis. So let's look at this next one. Eating ice cream daily affects happiness. Think about this. Is this a good hypothesis, a bad hypothesis, or is it okay? Eating ice cream daily affects happiness happiness. If you said it was a okay or a weak hypothesis, you would be right. 
it's not necessarily a bad hypothesis, but it's also not a great hypothesis. Um, it does outline how it will be tested, eating ice cream daily. Um, and it does predict a specific outcome. Well, but see, it even doesn't even do that. It, it doesn't really say how it will affect it. It gives an outcome, but it doesn't say it will make it better or worse. It just says it will affect, so it's very weak. The last hypothesis, participants who report eating ice cream every day will report feeling happier and more relaxed. Is this a good hypothesis, a bad hypothesis, or a weak hypothesis? Participants who report eating ice cream every day will report feeling happier and more relaxed is a good hypothesis because it provides um, an outline of how it will be tested, so they're, they're getting participants to, re to record eating if they ate ice cream or not, how many days they did it, and also if they felt happier and more relaxed. Happier, meaning the, eating the ice cream is going to increase happiness and also increase relax relaxation. So it, has a pers it does have a specific outcome predicted, so this is a good hypothesis. In terms of research, there are several terms that are very important for you to know and for you to understand. The first is population. The population is every individual in a specific group. So for example, all US college students. You are part of the population, all US college students. A sample would be a selection of the population that's examined for research, so all NDSU students. We could also say that NDSU students could be a population, and the students in Psych 250 are a sample of that population. Variables are something examined for constancy or plasticity. So using a stapler, it could be a variable. Paper could be a variable. And we're looking to see, OK, if I take the stapler and plunge it onto this paper, will a staple be deposited on it? These are two variables combined with a specific action and we're looking for a specific outcome. And that outcome is our effect. It's a change that results from a specific cause. The, the stapler, one variable, the paper, another variable being combined, the specific action or cause being squeezing it together, and the effect that we see is that a staple has been put into this piece of paper. Similar to an effect, but still different, is a relation, is what is relationship, or relation, and that is a link that exists between two variables. So for example, um, what was I going to use as my example? It's 11.51 at night, so I'm like having trouble bringing an example. <sighs> an example of a relationship between, or an association between two different variables would be if we were to find a link between eating Subway every day and weight loss. That is, that is a relationship. We don't know if the weight loss can be attributed to eating Subway or if it's attributed to the fact that person was, was actually going to the gym every day. Um, and the way that we establish whether or not we see an effect or relationship is very much dependent upon the type of research study that we do. So in a correlation design, we are looking for a relationship between variables or relation between variables or associations between variables. And what we do when we run this type of design, we collect data and then we run a core, we, we look at the Pearson's correlation between um, two or more variables. So we look at the variable subway, eating subway, and the variable um, losing weight. A positive correlation would show that at a higher rate of one variable, a higher rate of another variable also occurs. So eating subway more, leads to 
losing more weight, right? A negative correlation would be a higher rate of one variable equals a lower rate of another. So eating more Subway, losing less weight. So this, like, if, if the, the axis that we would be going, the value here would be uh, number of pounds lost. So the number of pounds lost goes down. That's a negative correlation. No correlation means there's not really a change between the two. You eat Subway every day, your weight doesn't really change at all. And our analysis would, would turn back, would, would give us a number, and that number is called a Pearson's R, or a correlation coefficient. And the scores of our correlation coefficient range from a negative 1 to a 1, um, <clears throat> which means that the closer you are to a negative 1 or a 1, you're closer, um, you're closer to either a, a strong positive relationship or a strong negative relationship. Zero means no relationship. So the closer you are to zero, the less likely there is or the less strong your relationship is. Um, you're looking for a correlation of about 0.5. That's, that's pretty normal. 0.7 is pretty good. You very rarely will see an, a, a one or a negative one. Um, you will see zeros, though. Um, the problem with a correlational design um, as is because we're, we're testing a relationship. And because we're testing a relationship between two variables, we can't claim that one variable causes another. We can only say they're related in some way. We don't really, we don't know if one causes the other. We just know that when we, that we see one variable and one, and we see one level of one variable, we see either uh, an increased level of another or a decreased level of another or no change in the level of another. We can't say that one thing causes another. On the other hand, if we do an experiment or an experimental design, <clears throat> we can claim causation. And that's because in an experimental design, you're manipulating an independent variable. And so there are three key variables that occur within an experimental design a dependent variable, which is the outcome that we expect to see, the independent variable, which is the, the variable that we're manipulating, and the confounding or third variable, which is an unconsidered variable that actually causes the observed outcome. So hold on to the confounding variable for just a minute. Let's talk about dependent and independent variables. Say I wanted to examine I wanted to do an experiment where I examined how drinking caffeine before bed influences the amount of hours slept. The amount of hours slept is the dependent variable. We want to see how that is changed by the independent variable, the amount of caffeine a person drinks. And so if I were to do this experiment, I would get a sample of people and I would bring them in. And then I would randomly assign those people to one of two groups. The control group, which is the group of participants who do not receive the manipulation, who don't receive the dose of um, PIB extra. The other half of the participants that I randomly selected would, which would receive the manipulation. They would be given an entire 20 ounce bottle of PIB extra that contains 66 milligrams of caffeine. <clears throat> Then I would have them come in and I would have the control group do something like just sit there. And I would have the experimental group chug one of these bad boys. The manipulation, the making someone drink this or not drinking this is our independent variable. Then I would tell both groups, no, go, 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 go to bed and let me know how many hours of sleep you got tomorrow after you wake up. So then I would record, okay, <clears throat> people in the control group on average got more sleep than people in the experimental group. So now I can say drinking a, a PIB extra before bed potentially causes, or causes, you can, I mean, I would still say potentially because, and we'll get to that in a minute, but you could make a causal claim. You could say that causes, drinking this caused people to sleep Less, less hours um, over the course of a night. Now, 
I say that I say that you could say potentially, or I would say potentially, because of our confounding or third variable right here. What if there's something about sitting in silence for half an hour while other people drink a Mr. Pib or a Pib Extra? What if there's something about that that makes people just sleep better? Like they got bored and so they were t more tired when it came down to it. That p could potentially be a, the variable that caused that difference to emerge. Maybe it wasn't the Mr. Pip. Maybe it was just the fact that, that the control group got rest. Maybe the people in the control group had a Mr. Pib or a Diet Coke or some other kind of caffeinated beverage before they came in. So they actually had two times the amount of caffeine than they were supposed to. And that maybe was the reason. So even with an experiment, you have to be careful in saying that one thing causes another because there could always be another explanation for why you saw what you did. But because we are manipulating an independent variable, we can claim that the independent variable causes the observed outcome. So that's the difference between this and a, and a correlational design because our correlational design only looks at the relationship. There's not a manipulation. You just you just ask everybody in your sample to give you the same data. There's no difference. You just ask them for the, for their feedback. This you're actually forcing people to do different things, behave in different ways, to see if there is a difference between the two groups. So with this, when you're when you're just getting feedback, you can't really say that one thing causes another. But when you're forcing people to behave in different ways and you see a difference between the two groups, you can say, okay, there is a cause. Within the framework of a experimental or a correlational design, we have different types, different other, those, if those are the context, and these are, are more specific designs that can fall within either an experimental or a con correlational design. So the one that we're going to start with is one that developmental psychologists use a lot, and that is a longitudinal research design. In a longitudinal research design, data is collected from a subset of the population, the sample, at multiple time points. And like I said, this is the primary research tool of developmental science. This could be an experimental design. So you could, ex you could do a, the same experiment multiple times over a point of time. Or it can be correlational. We're just collecting feedback from people multiple times throughout their life. One of the, str the strengths of the longitudinal research design is it establishes a trend. We can see, okay, there is a clear change in a group of people over time. It also provides a very reliable picture of individual change. When you're just doing one data collection in one point of time, one of the confounding variables could be that it just so happened at that point in time on that day of the year, everybody in Fargo who you sampled was just feeling kind of glum. It was probably like the middle of winter and they were all sad. So maybe that caused some kind of change in the outcome that we didn't expect. There are weaknesses, though, to longitudinal research design. They're not the answer to all of our problems as researchers. One of them is they're expensive and time-consuming to do. You have to pay people to participate in a longitudinal design. Um, you have to have some kind of incentive for them to keep doing it over and over again. Um, so it's expensive. It takes a lot of time to, to track those people down, to get their data, to write them a check, to enter all that data into a database. It takes a long time. We also see a very high attrition rate in longitudinal designs. People stop, people drop out, people die, people move away, and you don't collect, you can't collect more data. So then you don't really get to use their data at all because you don't have a full picture of how they changed over time. So that is a that's a huge weakness. Probably I would say the most the the, the biggest the key weakness in a longitudinal research design is attrition. So just to outline this and using a personal example, say I wanted to collect data from 1998, um, I was in kindergarten I think in 1998, to graduation from high school in 2010. So I'm collecting data at six different time points and I'm collecting the same exact questions, I'm asking the same questions over uh, 18 year, or sorry, 13 year period. And so I would collect data in August of 98, 
I would collect data in May of 01, I would collect data in August of 03, I'd collect data in May of 05, I would collect data in August of 07, and then I would find get the last bit of data in May of 2010. And that's what a longitudinal <laughs> research design would look like. I would ask the same questions at each of these time points, and then I would get all of my outcomes. Another type of design is a cross-sectional design. And in a cross-sectional design, data is collected from a subset of the population, or a sample, at one time point. And this is the most common research design. Um, so people come in, they give you, they do your study, they get you, you get the data from them, they leave, you never see them again. And this could either be an experiment or a correlational design. Um, the strengths of a cross-sectional design, well, it's quicker, easier, and less expensive to do. I did a cross-sectional study um, last semester, collected all of my data in four weeks. It cost me nothing to do, because I did it online. You can collect a large amount of data in a short period of time, and people usually don't drop out. If they're just doing it for 30 minutes, you're giving them extra credit for class, they're probably not going to drop out. But a huge weakness of it is it doesn't may not necessarily capture the true nature of the construct. Maybe there's a third variable that you can't rule out. Maybe people, maybe what we see, like the dip that we see in, in happiness at, at one specific moment is in a larger picture insignificant compared to the greater trend that we would have seen if we had collected the data longitudinally. So how this point, how this would work is say I started my data collection in August 2016, ended it in December of 2016, and participants would participate in the study at, at any point along this timeline, just one time, in and out, and that would be it. Another type of design that could fall under either an experimental or a correlational design is a sequential design. And this is when you um, collect data from multiple longitudinal or cross-sectional studies at varying times. Bear with, this is where it gets complicated. The strengths of a sequential design is that you can collect large amounts of longitudinal data in a very short amount of time. You're not following the same group of people for 18 years. You're just following them for a shorter period of time, but you're able to get a longer viewpoint because you're collecting it from multiple cohorts. Um, it also allows for you to control for cohort effects. And, and what I mean by cohort effect is that we can, we can say, okay, we see that people born in 92 may have different trajectories than people in born in 98, right? And so we're able to control for those differences and see, okay, does the progression of friendship, is it affected in any way by being born in 92 versus 98? Or is it pretty stable across those time periods? However, the hazard of a sequential design is that it has the same problems as both longitudinal and cross-sectional research designs because it can have features of both. So let's let's create a diagram for, because this is complicated. I can already tell you're just completely lost by this. <coughs> okay. So let's say you're born in 1992 and we collect data from you at the age of 5, the age of 11, and the age of 18 from 97 to 2010, and this is our first cohort. We collect the same data five years, five years later, starting five years later from cohort, a cohort two that was born in 98 at the ages of five, eight, 11, and 18. Now we've collected data from 97 to 2016, right? But we haven't required this group of people to be in it from 97 to 2016. Then we take data from cohort 3, which was born in 2004, and we start them at the age of 5 um, in 2010, and we run until 2022. So by the end of this period, we've collected data from 97 to 2022. So we can look at the way, so let's say friendship has changed from 1997 to 2022 without having 
this cohort run from 97 to 2022. And what this allows for us to do is to look at cohort effects. So do we see the exact same trend for five-year-olds in 97, five-year-olds in 03, and five-year-olds in 2010? Do we see the same outcome, or do we see the same path, the same trajectory, the same, the same outcomes, um, the same changes, or, or like growth, or, or, or drop um, for 11-year-olds in 03, 2010, or 2016? Do we see the same thing for 18-year-olds across these three different time periods? We're also able to look at longitudinal sequences. So we can either look at what um, the change in depression or the change in friendship, sorry, looks like from 92 to 2010, from 5 to 18, or we could look across 2010. We could look at 5-year-olds in 2010, 5-year-olds or 11-year-olds in 2010, and 18-year-olds in 2010. So this allows us many to run many different types of studies. And this is why this is so helpful. Another way that you could design a sequential study is you could have a group of people in your study who are five, a group of people who are 11, and a group of people who are 18. And you don't necessarily run multiple longitudinal studies. You could do all the collection in one year. You're just collecting from different age groups. That's technically a sequential design, but it's not as interesting as if you were to do it like this. So now that we've collected our data using one of our research methods, or more, one or more, because we would have a correlational sequential or an experimental sequential, potentially, or a correlational or experimental longitudinal study, or a correlational or experimental cross-sectional study. Once we've collected our data using one of those methods, <clears throat> we need to examine whether or not the findings that we've gotten from our data collection are valid. And there are many different types of validity, but the two main are external validity and external validity. Internal validity asks the question, did the research method capture the true nature of the outcome? In other words, did we do what we meant to do? Is what we did what we claim it to be? And there are two different types of, of validity that fall under external validity. The first is construct validity. Did the method measure what it claimed to measure? If we had people drink PIV extra before bed, and then we had them write in a journal how many hours they got, did that actually measure the effect of caffeine on sleep? Criterion validity ask the question, is the method actually related to the outcome? Is there actually, is drinking caffeine actually related to the outcome? Did we measure it in such a way? Did the method that we use actually capture this, this, this relationship or this, this association? So that's in internal validity, but external validity asks a very important question really the central question to everything that we, we do and stand for as scientists, are the findings that we got from our study generalizable to the population? In other words, did our study actually capture life as it is, or is it just a fluke? Did we just capture how life is in Fargo? Did we just capture how life is in Site 250? Or is the sample that we collected from representative of the entire population? Is the subset, the way that they answer, the same way that every single person, had we measured them, had, if, if we had measured every single person, how they would have answered? So external validity is incredibly important. But also internal validity is important too. Because if, if the method did not capture the true nature, then, then the external validity is also going to be affected, right? When it comes to the way that we collect data, there are different methods by which we can get the data points that we need to do our experiment. The first type are systematic observational methods. And these are, are there are two different types. The first are naturalistic observations. And this is just when you're sitting down, when there's a psychologist sitting, a, sitting in a room, sitting at a playground, spying from behind a two-way glass, um, watching and reporting the behaviors of participants. 
the strengths of a naturalistic observation is that it shows everyday life, so it has really good external validity, potentially. However, a weakness would be the researcher bias. If I'm watching how people interact with each other in, in the union, it's going to be it's going to be informed by the way that I see the world and the way that I see other people. So it could potentially have lower internal validity. On the other hand, we could use structured observation, and that's when we have people come into a research lab, and we have we and we create an artificial behavior like an artificial situation where the behavior we want to measure is evoked or is is incited. We get people to do something based on this artificial situation that we've developed. The good thing about a structured observation is that it has good internal validity. We are able to predict pretty well whether or not we've measured what we intended to measure. The problem is, because it's an artificial situation that we've created, it may not be externally valid. It may not generalize, so it may have lower external validity. Other methods we could use are self-report methods, and this is when we get the participants to tell us exactly what they would do, how they feel, why they feel that way, instead of just observing it, of collecting that data without them really knowing um, knowing what we're asking them. So the first is a clinical interview. I have done so many clinical interviews because I used to work as a therapist when I was training to be a clinical psychologist. And with a clinical interview, basically you have a clinician or a researcher asking questions that are based on a flexible interview, um, which captures a participant's thoughts. We have general questions, but we don't have to necessarily follow, like ask each question or ask it in the same way. We're just kind of seeing what they think and how they feel. The strengths of this, again, we get a lot of information. We get a breadth of information and depth of information about that person because people like to talk about themselves. However, the problem is, one, we could experience biased responding. People tend to talk about themselves in positive ways. So that could bias the um, the things that they're telling the researcher. Also, because we're not necessarily asking the same questions to every participant in the same exact way, it can be difficult to compare their responses. We can get around this, though, by using questionnaires. And these are structured measures which ask participants the same questions. Um, and the great thing about this is they're easy to compare. The problem, though, is they don't give as much information as an interview. So a questionnaire question could be, I, felt sa I have felt sad more days than not in the last two weeks. And so they could say yes or no, which would not be the best <laughs> way, like the best response options to provide. I would say like on a scale of one to five, with one being not at all like me to five being very much like me. That's really easy to compare. The problem is we don't understand anything about the quality of that sadness. Whereas if we were to do a clinical interview and I would be to say, well, have you felt sad at all in the last couple of weeks? And they, were, they would could answer potentially, yeah, you know, I've, I've just felt really down, but, you know, I've still been able to get work done. You know, I just felt sad. That tells us a lot more than, yes, very much like me, I felt sad every day this week. Um, so, you know, you trade, you trade lack of lack of sophisticated information for easy to compare information. Other methods that you could employ to collect data include a case study. This is a small sample study, usually uh, one to two people, maybe three, usually not more than that. And you're, comp you're capturing a specific individual or group of individuals' behaviors or thoughts. So we typically do case studies when a behavior, f behavioral phenomenon is, is not is unique. It's not something that we commonly see. So for example, the research done with Jeannie, the girl I talked about at the beginning of class, who had been deprived and neglected and hadn't developed any like sophisticated language um, skills because of her captivity, that was a case study. It was it just looked at one person because it's not common for children to be treated this way. And so we would use a case study in situations like that. The strengths of a case study is you get rich descriptive insight because we are talking hours and hours of multiple researchers writing down their observations of one or two or three people. Um, the weaknesses though, very low external validity. 
you can't really capture, you can't say that one person or two people or three people capture an entire population of people. Case studies are still valuable, though. They're valuable when we have these weird phenomena that we never, we don't normally see. They're atypical or potentially abnormal, you know, um, and they can be valuable, but they don't really tell us um, as much as if we had measured a lot of different people with similar experience. Another, which is fascinating, I I've always kind of wanted to do this, is an ethnography. Eth ethno coming from the same word as ethnicity, so cultural group. Um, and an ethnography is the observation of a specific culture from that culture's point of view. So say I wanted to research um, adolescent high school girl culture. I can't think of anything I would rather not do. Um, you know, an ethnography, if I wanted to do an ethnography, then I would have to go back to high school and live as a high school girl. Heaven forbid, I would not do that in a million years. Like, I could think of so many other things, like, I don't know, having open heart surgery without anesthetic, um, that I would rather do than go back to high school. Like, Lord, no. I hate, Lordy, Lordy, I do not want to go back to high school. Thank you very much. Um, but an ethnography would be me going back and observing that behavior and writing about it as a high school girl. And and a lot of very famous studies of cultural groups have been ethnographies. We've had scientists, anthropologists, psychologists, sociologists go into these remote cultures and live as that and live among that culture as a member of that culture and writing about their experiences as a person in, within that culture. Again, very rich, descriptive insight. However, it's still subjected to the researcher's bias. It's not systematic. It doesn't follow a system. It doesn't follow a standard. It just is based on what they're observing. So it has very low external validity. So it can provide us with like a good, good insight, but not necessarily anything that we would want to say is a definitive answer to a question. All right, well, thank you for paying attention today. I have enjoyed our second class together. Um, please send me an email at darcy.corbitthall, C-O-R-B-I-T-T-H-A-L-L, -L, at NDSU. If you have any questions, um, you can also stop by my office. Now, I will say, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but I need to mention it today, I will not be in my office today. Um, I will be in my office on Thursday, but I will not be in my office um, on Wednesday. And I also will not be in my office on Friday. So if you need to see me, um, please come see me on Thursday or email me to set up an alternate time. Actually, no, I will be in my office on Friday. I'm sorry, I'm leaving at noon on Friday. I'll be in Bismarck this weekend. Um, so, um, yeah, so I'll be in my office Thursday and Friday, but not today, which is Wednesday. Um, for our next class, so for Thursday's class, please read pages 39 to 40 in your textbook and do the first reading, the sub first supplemental reading that is on Blackboard. I have provided... Um, I have provided, just to remind you, a link to um, the survey that will help me identify what times would be good for us to schedule um, um, the exams and also the project meeting times. While you're reading pages 39 to 40, is that right? See, I think that's suspicious now that I look at it. I don't want to give you the wrong thing, so let me... Let me take a look here at the syllabus and see what is going on. Because that seems like a very odd page range, 39 to 40. Oh, wait, we're doing diversity. So, yes, there's hardly any diversity or ethics in the textbook. So I think that is right. Well, let me just double check. Give the textbook author a benefit. of. I mean, it, you'll find that there are times when I go way off the textbook because the te textbook doesn't include things that I think are important, which is the benefit of having a, you know, a teacher as opposed to just teaching yourself. 39 to 40, really? That's bizarre. Let me just make sure that I'm not off the mark here. That just seems really weird. Huh. 
39 to 40. All right, folks, one page of ethics. <laughs> Read page 39 to 40 in the book, and then the supplemental reading one, which is found on Blackboard. Hmm. And I want you to think about this question. Why is it important for us to think about the experiences of minority and marginalized populations when we ask research questions? Minorities being ethnic minorities, racial minorities, sexual minorities, so um, lesbian, gay, or bisexual, asexual, pansexual, queer people, um, gender minorities, transgender people, and then marginalized groups being women, for example, who are not minorities but are still marginalized. Remember, on Friday you have your first quiz, not a reading quiz, the actual week quiz. I will do, I promise, a much better job of proofreading this. Um, and then remember to take the Tell Me About You survey on Blackboard under the Opportunities for Further Learning page um, by Friday so that you can get those two points on your um, midterm exam. All right, I will see you all tomorrow. Have a good day. Let me know if I can do anything for you, and um, be nice to each other. Bye.